Welcome to the Over 40 Alpha Podcast with your host, Funk Roberts. We are live, we are live, we are live, and welcome to the Over 40 Alpha Podcast. This is episode number 158, and I'm your host, Funk Roberts, former professional athlete turned master metabolic trainer, certified hormone and testosterone expert, and a health and fitness guru for men in their 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, and beyond. And I'm your host, and this podcast is specifically designed for you, the man over 40, and where we hear, we talk about how to naturally increase your testosterone levels, mindset strategies, workouts, nutrition, recovery, sleep, supplementation, and health issues. And on today's episode, we are going to talk to my buddy, my friend, and, uh, you know, I guess, I guess fellow fitness expert for men over 40, Dimitri Giancoulis. And I'm excited to have him on because we're going to really talk about unpacking trauma that you had uh you know when you were younger and how that's affected decisions that you've made throughout your life and more importantly decisions that you're making today right if you're not getting the results that you're looking for if you're struggling to lose weight if you're struggling in your health and fitness if you're struggling in your business or we're at work if you're struggling with your kids if you're struggling um you know with with everyday life not knowing why things aren't working out why things aren't where they want to be why you feel you know why you just don't feel you don't feel like yourself it could be because of some type of trauma that you're still holding on to and not holding on like oh i'm using this as a crutch but that you just have not let go and so today i'm excited because dimitri's going to share with you something that happened to him when he was younger that had to do with his father and that he kept in for pretty much his entire life until COVID. COVID was 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 a turning point. But you're going to hear his story. And I'm hoping that his story, I know for me, it really emphasizes the importance of letting go and how as men who are in our 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, as men who are Generation X, some baby boomers. We lived in a time where there was no phones, there was no social media. There was a lot. We there's a lot of shit that we have gone through, whether it's things that we've done or things that we've had done to us, specifically when we were kids. Um, things that we've pushed down and not taken care of, not spoken about, because you know we want to be macho, we want to be strong, we don't want to be weak. But those things will come back to haunt you in your 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s. They'll sabotage. You'll start sabotaging yourself. You'll start making bad decisions and bad choices, and it will spiral from there. We're losing more and more men because of mental health issues, because of suicide. You know, I met Dimitri. Dimitri's from here, from Toronto, right? So we kind of like like we know the areas that that we grew up in and i think even angela used to work out at the gym that he he used to manage at some point but dimitri i met dimitri at a mastermind in tennessee we 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 both were at a mastermind right like where where you know you go in and and you pay to 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 be amongst others who are in the same industry doing the same things and it's run by all of these different you know f- experts in you know whatever it was whether it was digital media or fitness or high ticket coaching whatever it is but when, as soon as i met him we hit it off 100 percent. i loved his passion i loved his energy i loved his unwavering commitment to what he does with his clients because him and his wife own a gym so the other thing he'll talk about is the power of that that connection that he has with his wife but that commitment is unmatched and, and his passion is is so so there i'm almost positive he's aries I think he's Aries. I think he's actually born the day after me. Like, so I thought it was great to have him on the podcast because I've seen him on YouTube tell his story. And I watched that story and I was like blown away at the power of his story with his father and how that affected him as he grew up. It's incredible. And how that sabotaged a lot of his decisions, even though, it seemed on the surface that he was doing great, right? He was a bodybuilder. He won a ton of bodybuilding uh, competition. You know, he 
he opened up a he was a he was one of the leading managers of a fitness um a big box fitness gym franchise took it from last place to number one uh he opened up his own gym his own gym and so on the surface it seems like he's doing fantastic but inside he he was dying and so you know I'm really excited to have him on. Dimitri is a leader in the fitness world. He's had over 11,000 hours of hands-on personal training, so he understands and knows the body, but he's now focusing on men over 40, which is why I think it's really important to have him on because I think with his experience as a certified personal trainer, a performance nutrition specialist, a director of personal training and nutrition at Pure Motivation um, Fitness, and having his own gym, he brings a lot to the table that a lot of us men are still struggling with. So I want you to enjoy this podcast. It was really exciting to have him on. He's not only a fellow fitness expert, but he is also a friend. We talk all the time. And, uh, you know, it's really nice to have those guys on your podcast. Plus, he's from he's from the 4 double four double O. No, he's from the T-Dot, Toronto. Anyways, um, with that being said, this is going to be an extremely powerful conversation. His story is, is something that I know that maybe a lot of you listening or watching can relate to. Not specifically his story, but relate to the things that he was saying about not addressing it when he was younger. It's, it's incredible. You do not want to miss this. This is an incredible story. And I hope that it inspires you, it motivates you, and it allows you to, be, to feel like you're safe in getting rid of that trauma that you may have experience when you were younger because it is affecting your life today so with that enjoy the podcast welcome to another episode of the over 40 alpha podcast this is the go-to podcast for men in their 40s 50s 60s and 70s helping you to transform your health and life and today i'm excited because not only do i have an incredible get a guest with a wealth of information but he's also a friend right i met this guy amazing guy at a mastermind in Tennessee, and literally we just connected. You could just tell we, you know, I really respected um, the way he, the way he, he uh, presented himself. Um, a lot of passion, a lot of energy, a lot of commitment. Not just to the fitness industry, but he also runs a gym and the commitment to his, his clients and is also his wife because his wife was there too. Uh, their kids, it, it's amazing. So I thought it was really important to bring on Dimitri Jankoulis, my Toronto brother, onto the podcast today. Talk about uh, health and fitness for men over 40. So Dimitri, welcome. Welcome. Thank you, man. I appreciate you having me. It's nice to be next to a, a pioneer like you. Stop it. Stop. Pioneer, is that you? Does that mean I'm old? <laughs> no, you got some white in there. I got some yeah, white. In there. Don't worry. All right. So okay, you still look twenty five, man. It's all good. Oh, thank you. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. It's all that cocoa butter. But anyway, <laughs> anyway. Yeah, so let's talk about um, your journey here because you know you've been in the fitness industry probably around since nineteen ninety seven. I'm not even sure before. Yeah. I I do yeah. remember you talking about your childhood and. Yeah how that all brought you to where you are today. So share your journey because I think this, your journey is gonna, gonna be uh, beneficial for a lot of men, like a lot of men our age. Um, you know, yeah, who- and I think a lot of men will, will also, they'll relate because those people, those guys uh, that have gone through struggle, there's either two things that happened to them. The struggle made them a stronger man and made them get over it, or it slowly crippled them. And they can still break free if they keep an open mindset and they're looking to break free. But sometimes we let that struggle break us down and we carry that story with us. So shifting back, I'm 46 now. Um, My mom came to Canada as an immigrant um, from Greece. She came with her brothers working hard. Um, She met my dad. Um, They got together. It was kind of like a gunshot wedding because, you know, back in Greece, when you're a female, you're 18, 19, you're still a virgin. Dad and mom don't want you talking to nobody. So she kind of escaped that crazy lifestyle to come here. Met my dad, thought he was a really, really great guy. Didn't have that much background on him because, again, they weren't dating for not long. But um, there was a hidden secret that she didn't know about. And um, he was involved in a car accident um, prior to meeting my mom with two of his buddies. Um, he was 19 at the time. He was 
they were drinking, they were out speeding, they hit a, a big pole, like one of those poles on the streets that have all the lights on. Pole came down, crushed the guy in the back, killed the guy in the back, paralyzed his buddy in the side, and put my dad in a coma for four months. Um, no one mentioned this to my mom before they met. So this guy, at the end of the story, when I get to it, you'll realize that had I known all this happened, it would have changed the trajectory of the last 40 years of my life. But to go back to it, got into a coma for four months, came out of the coma, guy was 20 pounds lighter, had issues with himself, mental um, health issues, but his family wasn't there to support him. He only came with a brother and a sister. They kind of left him to fend. Um, in Canada, they told him, you can't drive no more. You can't get certain jobs no more. So he was left, you know, on some disability, getting odd jobs. Uh, met the wrong crowd. St. Clair and Caledonia, man, you know, hanging out at the coffee shops, gambling, drinking. Um, that got really, really bad. My mom had no clue. No one from his family mentioned to my mom that, hey, by the way, the guy you're going to meet was in a coma for four months, so there may be some issues you want to talk about. She had no clue, had my brother. Um, six years went by. Things were kind of getting rocky, drinking a lot, um, aggressive behavior, leaving for weeks at a time, coming back. My mom didn't know what to do. Mm -hmm. um, aggressive. She told me there was times where he even gave her abortion pills, and had it not been for my uncle's girlfriend at the time, <laughs> She would have taken them. Mm. Um, there was so much challenges. And then there was a point where he kind of did a turnaround and said, hey, man, I'm turning around. I'm going to be better. Um, let's have another kid. So my mom said, you know what? Maybe this is the right guy. Maybe I'll have another chance. Um, got pregnant with me. And then three months into the pregnancy, he just decided that, you know, this isn't going to work. And he left. Mm. And he left my mom in Toronto, St. Joseph Hospital. And she was alone with one with her with my brother um she basically gave birth to me and then one of her friends said hey get him legally divorced or your kid's going to be a bastard mm. so she got legally divorced and i'm telling you as my witness bro i'm 46 now i went to his funeral two years ago mm. in 44 years i didn't get a phone call i didn't get a present i didn't get a call it was just absent mm. um this built toxicity in me. This built uh, a, a negative. I, I hated marriages. I hated the word dad. Mm. Think about it. Growing up, we grew up in Jane and Trithui, yeah. Ontario housing. You know what I mean? Yeah, right here. <laughs> Welfare. You know, you, you, yeah. you understand, right? Yeah. Welfare checks, you know, food stamps and all that. And growing up in, in, this, in this, you know, um, this building that I grew up with, all my friends were like, you know, uh, in the same scenario. Yeah. And it was weird. And I thought, maybe is this well? And then on my 10th birthday, my mom sat me down and said, listen, I'm going to be real with you. This is the scenario. Your dad's gone. He left. He ain't coming back. He was trying to have me abort you. Mm -hmm. um, he's a drinking guy. He took all our jewelry. He gambled it. So what is any other 10-year-old kid going to do? He's going to believe his mom. You know, family members thought he was a, uh, you know, the worst thing that ever happened. So I grew up thinking, you know what, this is what, this is my, 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 my cards. Uh -huh. And I got through so much childhood problems in school. <clears throat> I was kicked out of class every day. <laughs> uh, I didn't know how to deal with it. I tried being the class clown to get attention, uh -huh. you know, maybe to feel some kind of, uh, uh, some kind of, of, of love somewhere that didn't work. Um, and it just really started breaking down on me. And then it wasn't till I experienced my first coach and I get goosebumps on this because there's a sign right here that says coaches change lives on my, on my, my board here. Yeah. Okay, coaches change lives. I don't care what facet of life you're in, whether you're in marriage, whether it's school, whether it's training, coaches will change your life. Mm. So my mom had to work in the summers. Like, you know, she was working full time. She was going to school at nighttime at Seneca College. My brother's six years older than me. So he was out with his buddies doing whatever. And there's this 10 year old kid not knowing where to go. So my mom's like, just stay in the area and just keep yourself busy. So I would go to the pool and I would just stand by the fence and I would watch these, co these swimming lifeguards teaching people stuff. And they eventually said, yo, man, you're here every day. Like, <laughs> what are you doing? Where's your family? So I basically told them, you know, I don't got a dad and blah, blah. They called my mom. They brought her in. They said, listen, we understand that, you know, um, children's aid uh, doesn't want you knowing that your kid's 
nine, ten years old and you're not around. What's going on? And she said, listen, this is the story. I got to support these kids. I'm trying to, you know, better myself. And they said, listen, bring your kid here every day, bring food with him and leave him here for eight hours. And we're going to make him be an apprentice. And they literally took me in and they literally made me do everything from getting their lunch to cleaning the pool to chlorine. And in return, they said, we know you love swimming. We're going to teach you how to swim really well. And that was like the first bit of God saying, don't worry, we got a plan for you. So they, they taught me how to swim. They taught me how to do the butterfly. They taught me. I was there every day, every day, like a little, like a little apprentice. And I started recognizing that I can get love in different ways. I can get love from strangers who don't know me. I can get love from people in the pool who are just friends. And maybe it's not going to be that bad. And then when they entered me into my first swim challenge at 10, and I just cleaned house with the butterfly because it was, oh, I looked at that stroke and I'm like, wow, this is the, it's better than running. Mm. So when I got my first medal and my first ribbon, that was the catalyst of something in me saying, competing is going to make you become the better man. Mm. Competing is going to make you practice more. Competing is going to force you to be disciplined. And it literally, it put blinders on me. And as a 10-year-old kid growing up in the ghetto, I felt okay. Mm. So then that transferred into track and field, and I started doing great over there. And then I started, you know, getting older. And the more people, when, when they would say to me, hey, what's going on? Like, you know, my teachers would be like, for Father's Day, you don't want to get involved in drawing stuff. And for parent teachers, you know, we were finding mm. out about your lifestyle. And in me, as much as I wanted to keep it quiet and not really talk about it, something just said, yeah, I'm okay, no problem. Yeah, my dad left. And then people would go into asking me about it, and my mom would be like, don't tell people your business. Keep it at distance. Keep mm. it quiet. Mm. And I'm like, why? Why am I going to mm. keep it quiet? What am I going to hide? I don't have a father, okay? doesn't mean I can't function. I'm winning medals. I'm healthy. You love me. It's all that matters. So I recognized at a young age that competing in sports like really brought me happiness. Mm. And then when I went to high school and then I was mentored by my high school coaches who took it to a next level. And like, you know, uh, I broke records in my grade nine year for rookie of the year because I was the only athlete that did five teams in a year when you could mm. only do four. Swimming was a team you could do all year round because it was at 6 a.m. in the morning. And, uh, you know, there's a certain amount of guys that want to get to the pool at 6 a.m. and just swim for an hour and a half, shower, go upstairs. And while people are in class and you're dripping water, you stink like chlorine. <laughs> Everyone's just getting in. Oh, I'm late for school. So I developed the mindset of it's okay. Um, you can, you will, something, there's something in store for you. Mm. And then if it wasn't for the guy up behind me, Arnold, I'm telling you, if it wasn't for Arnold Sly, Van Damme, Michael Jordan, if it wasn't, I was literally looking to athletes as my dad. Really? My my bedroom was covered, the whole wall. Dorian Yates, Dolph Lundgren, Stallone, Arnold, all the classics. And my mom thought at one time, she's like, hey, I want to talk to you. Like, <laughs> you like girls? She's like, you know, you have a lot of boys here. This is a Greek mom from a little town in... And I'm like, no, man, this is, she goes, so why do you have so many? I go, because when I wake up in the morning, I want to fuel off this. Mm. I don't have someone to be my dad. I need to become the father in me. She goes, fine. So then I started recognizing, man, if you really put your mind to it, you can have a defect in your life and you can get over it. Mm. So then my, my coach, my wrestling coach, uh, Mr. Williams, <laughs> he recognized that I was like my, in grade 11, I was doing all these teams and training and training. And then, like, then he started recognizing that I wasn't happy. He said, what's wrong? I'm like, I want to get bigger. I want to get stronger. I want to have a body because I was an ectomorphic skinny kid. And he goes, go get Arnold's Encyclopedia. There's a chapter in there that talks about skinny guys like you. I'm like, for real? Was, yeah. Anything he told me to do, I would do. Get the garbage bag. Put your arms in. Run with the garbage <laughs> bag. Practice. Remember? We do that. You know? 100%. We're going to lose weight for Got to cut we're weight like, for we're healthy. We're like intoxicated, <laughs> sweating. Everything's, you know, we're doing things wrong. But I listened to him. Mm. And when I read it, it's like something said to me, wow, man, this is unique. Like there's, 
there's three. There's a tall, skinny guy that can eat bread all day and he can't gain weight. There's a guy in the middle who's V-tapered and he can gain, he can lose. There's another one to the end that's got a slow metabolism. And then I started looking around people and I'm like, man, am I the only one who's recognizing that this has some validity? So I started researching more and reading and reading about different body types and I just fell into it. And then I go, I got it. So I, I snipped off track and fields and then I snipped off wrestling practice and I went to the gym mm. and I started gaining weight and I started the body building your armor, builds your confidence. And, and men over 40 think that confidence may come from money, may come from the trophy wife, may come from the accolades, may come from your business and your assets. No, man, that comes from you. Mm -hmm. So I built up myself to a certain level and I'm like, wow, this is what I want to do. I want to continue this. But again, having to give your mom money for rent, working full time. My mom made me work from nine, man. Newspaper route, nine to 11, oh McDonald's. God. She lied and told them I was 15. Meanwhile, I was 14 in McDonald's. You know, would you like fries with that? <laughs> and she taught me the hard route, man. Just like probably you and many out there. Mm -hmm. Work for what you want. So I had to support her when we were in high school. And then it got to the point where when I was done high school, I'm like, I just want to work and make money because I don't want to live like my mom did. I never want to be poor. I never want to have to be worried about buying my kids something. Mm -hmm. So then I went full time working as, as, a, as a waiter at the keg for four years. Mr. Greek, four, I was always loyal. I worked for four or five years at a time. And then, you know, Arnold and, and bodybuilding really in, 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 in engulfed me. And I became addicted to it in a healthy way. Right. Where if I was taking steroids at a young age and I got into the wrong route, then I would understand that. And then I met my first mentor, Chris Simpson, and uh, he came to and – and I always tell young kids, like, when you see someone that you aspire to, don't be shy. Stop them. Call them. Ask them. Email them. Say, yo, I want to talk to you. I want to learn from you mm -hmm. because you never know the advice they may give you. So he came to eat dinner with his, with his uh, fiance at the time. And he was sitting at my table and I just, I looked at his body and I was so fascinated with the human body. I love the anatomy. Maybe it's the Greek in me, maybe it's the whatever, but mm -hmm. sat down with him. And I said, Hey man, I said, before you say anything, I want to know what you do and, and I want to, and I want to be part of it. He told me I own a little fitness studio on Vaughn and I do this and he goes, why don't you come up? Maybe I'll, I'll help you out. So I went there and I didn't want to tell my restaurant company that I was working there as well because they would have dropped me in a spot, but I was doing both jobs. And then my wife's like, listen, you can't be a waiter all your life. You can't be like, you know, a gym guy. You got to go back to school. So Francesca, who's my wife now, we're, we've been together for 29 years. She's been my rock. Since she you've been she, since she, high she, school, right? Was that? Well, how long? So since high school? I met her at 18, bro. Just yeah. when I left high school at the wow. News Nightclub in Toronto. So <laughs> I was in high school. I got my car and I'm like, I'm the man. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And then she said, no, you got to go back to school. You got to get something. You got to get some paper behind you. And she, and I didn't want to, because again, all I thought about was I'm making good money. My young guy bought my own car, my own money. I'm going to be able to pay for my own rent. She's like, mm -hmm. no, go to school. You have more to that. And when I went to school, again, coaches started coming up to me and Chris mentored me as a bodybuilding coach. Uh, my first, my trophies right above me there, yeah, all my medals. And it just showed me love. And it showed me that, it's okay if my dad left me. And even though I, I hated the word dad, it was toxic. It was black. And I did not want to ever, people said, why don't you go meet him? I'm like, no, I don't want to meet him. He left me. I don't want to meet him. So I built this fake persona of Dimitri. And meanwhile, as much as, as men will try to focus on grinding and grinding and grinding, that's the wrong way, bro. Because mm. that little flame inside of you of negativity and pain it's still going to grow and it's going to spread. So as much as I was this confident bodybuilding guy, motivated guy, could speak to an audience, my wife's the only one knew that I would be crying sometimes out of no reason because mm -hmm. I'm lonely. Mm -hmm. So I kept that, you know, that stubbornness. I didn't want to bother with him. I started competing in drug-free bodybuilding for nine years. Wow. Um, I started building a name for myself. I started, I left that club. I went downtown to Premier Fitness um, I worked for the horrible owner, John Cardillo, back in the days, Premier. That's where the bad days were. He would sign you up for yeah. a pre-sale, and yeah. then he'd say the club closed down, and there goes your money. Yep. But um, I went to him, and I said, listen, I want to be a manager. And he says, oh, you're going to be a trainer? And he goes, you prove yourself. So in 90 days, I took Premier's worst location, 
from like 19th out of 21 locations to second place. He promoted me. Then Bally Total Fitness reached out to me. They're like, hey, man, we want to bring you into our company. We heard about you. You're downtown Bay. We're at Bay and Blue or you're at Bay and Davenport. Come over and have lunch. They opened, they, they, they just welcomed me with open arms. They gave me whatever I wanted. They gave me a team. They gave me a club. They said, you want to manage? Manage Bay and Bloor. Biggest wow. business location. Yeah. I crushed it. I asked them, what's the quota? They said, back in those days, 22 grand. I got my little trophy back there, which nice. I broke that up, no problem. So it built up this confidence. So mm. I had my wife. I had, you know, by the time we were engaged, I had everything going for me, but there was still that black side that when i say black i mean yeah. like uh, 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 if you said dark the, like yeah if, if you said snow it's not white for me it's right. black yeah it's yeah. Clean. yeah so i kept that aside i grew up i i left the big box chains once i recognized after four or five years again that bally's was growing too big they're just mm. this big corporate conglomerate and they were slowly losing money they're slowly going bankrupt in canada mm. so i asked one of my mentors because i always again I didn't know better. So if I had a client that was successful, I'd be like, Funk, can you please help me? Mm -hmm. And I, I don't have a dad. I don't have a mom that can help me out. Can you? And mm -hmm. I was open with it. And people were like, wow, man, you're really cool. Doesn't it hurt? I'm like, no, I'm okay. But deep down inside, it was killing me. Mm -hmm. So he said, quit. Quit, open up your own company. Do the in-home training business. So I did the in-home training. I was driving my car. Like It, it gave me an, an avenue of going from top-notched in Toronto managing 17 clubs to nobody. Right. And I think everybody watching, listening, needs some of that in their life. You've got to go from being at your best to getting your knees chopped and boom. So now you got to be like, are you, are you going to step up and level up as a man mm. or are you going to cripple? So that grew really quickly. I kind of, I got to the point where I couldn't sell no more because I was driving from Oakville to Toronto to Woodbridge to Thornhill. I'm like, I can't do this. My wife's pregnant. What am I going to do? So I went to another mentor client of mine and he said, hey, get your numbers in line, go to the bank, show them what you're doing, get a business plan going, and then get a loan, open up your own business. So nobody wanted to give me money because again, my mom didn't have money, I didn't have a background. Um, so I went, RBC gave me 250K, uh, BDC gave me 100K. I scrounged up 75K of my own and like I, I went to the bank with a box of cash. I'm like, where'd you get this from? Like, I'm a waiter. I'm a trainer. I cut grass. I don't do anything for you. That's amazing. So then I approached the, this this plaza that I'm at at Dufferin and Major Mac, and they're like, "Sorry, man, you don't got no covenants. You don't got. You don't have nothing that we could take from you. We have no name from you." I said, "Can I come back to you with a business plan? I got stats from all the clubs I worked at." I go, I want this. I want to open up my gym. And I didn't want to do it in Toronto. I didn't want to go Thornhill. I wanted to go a little bit north, kind of segregated. And I came to this area. And this, they're building a big, big plaza. And nobody was supposed to be here until they built it up. So I came back to them with a wicked business plan, mm. signed letter from RBC, BDC. They're like, let's go. Come in. Because they recognize a young guy is going to sign himself, indemnify himself <laughs> if he loses it. He loses everything. I didn't even know what that word meant. Yeah. And my lawyer goes, you know, by signing this, they can yeah. take your home, your car, everything. I'm like, just don't worry. I'm going to do it. I can do it. Right. And, and, and when it comes to being a strong role model as a man, as an uncle, as a dad, as a teacher, anything, even if you, you're, you're mentoring someone as your neighbor, you need to have the vision of what you want, like Arnold said. Because if you can't see it, you can't feel it. You can't mm. smell it. You can't hear it. So if it means you're overweight and you're fat right now and you hate the way you look, you need to stop and say, yo, man, when I was in my 20s, I used to look good. Mm -hmm. So that picture's got to be on your phone. Mm -hmm. That picture's got to be in your bedroom. I got right? Yeah. So I just, I just want to... Dude, yeah. this is amazing so far. This is amazing. But I just want to, I want to dive on that because when I was, uh, I, I had a program called Spartacus Workout and I was trying Love to man, get, bro. I was trying to get lean and ripped. And so I did that exact, I put a picture of uh, uh, Obi Obidaku. Okay. I put a picture of him because he looked like me, black, and his body was shredded that's so every I put that picture everywhere, yeah. literally everywhere, because that's who I looked. I wanted to I wanted to look like him. 
And if you look at my, I have a, I got to post this somewhere, but I have an eight week transformation. Every week I took a picture, right? Cause I was almost at the point, but I just needed to get ripped. If you look at the picture of me at my eighth week and then him, we almost look identical yes. because yes. I yes. only saw him all the time. And I think that that's a very powerful statement that you made when you said either think about when you were like, you know, ripped or when you were healthy or when you were athletic or whatever, take that picture from back in the day and post it because that's what you want to get to or choose somebody yes. and look at that picture every single day. Someone who's, you know, don't go overboard. I didn't go overboard with Obadaki because I was kind of close, but not right. Not, I mean, you know, there's still work to be done, but that can be the vision. Like you said, smell, taste, touch like that is so important. And, and I, I kind of took Arnold's role model saying, listen, I'm going to build my body to have a body. Um, he said, I'm going to go into Hollywood and then I'm going to become a politician. So I told myself, how am I going to make it in this world? Well, fix yourself, work on you first, build your body. And then from there, if you're going to build your body, do something with it. So when I got into bodybuilding, I didn't get into bodybuilding because I wanted to become a bodybuilder and win medals making me my life. But I said to myself, if I ever want to open up a gym or do something, I need authority, I need credibility, and I need to do that. So I did it for nine years. I didn't continue. You know, my, my, my pictures are there, and I, I've done really, really well. But I didn't want to continue because I knew that there's a side of bodybuilding which requires drugs. There's a side of bodybuilding which requires performance-enhancing, you know, use. And I just said, you know what? It's not for me. My, my goal in life, to tell you the truth, bro, was to be a dad. That was my goal, to have kids and to give the love that I never got. So came to the plaza. Plaza was working well. You know, we expanded after four or five years um, with my wife's help. We, we did it. We, we actually ran it well. And then COVID came by and just took everything away from us and just shot us down. So I'm like, here we go again. The, the, outside the gym, there's a beer store full of people waiting in line. There's, you know, people in line at the grocery store, but I can't bring in 10 clients to work out in the gym. So I literally lost my whole team. I lost my GM, Dan the man for 10 years. I lost my office manager, my, my coaches. And I literally was in here shutting off the lights to conserve energy, just going through depression. And again, what started kicking in was that, that, that father leaving, you know, maybe this is just mm -hmm. something. It just started coming back to me. So... One of my coaches, again, I started hiring business coaches 10 mm -hmm. years ago. And if it wasn't for me hiring my first coach who came in, um, Jeremy, who was a business coach, who came mm -hmm. in and told me, you got to change some stuff up in your gym, man. You're kind of running a gym model. You got to meet this guy called, uh, called um, Thomas Plummer from the U.S. And, you know, Thomas Lister. So I started going to the U.S., traveling, spending money, mm -hmm. becoming part of these masterminds and paying for these guys to come to Toronto to say, yeah. yo, help me out. I got the drive. I got the work ethic, but I don't have the experience. Mm -hmm. So all these business mentors were like, stop selling membership. I'm like, why? Don't sell membership no more. Just sell coaching. And if people that come to your door don't want to buy coaching, don't sell them because you want to people have committed. So wow. all the stuff that my coaches told me worked. Right. So my last coach, Tim Lines, he goes to me, embrace the suck, man. He goes, I'm in the U.S. and Arizona right now, but you got to embrace the suck. You mm -hmm. can't let it drop you down right now. Mm -hmm. He goes, get something, do something to kind of make you to remember that where you came from. So I went and got this tattoo. Mm. I'm not sure if you can read it, but it says happiness mm. is a decision. Yes, yes. And I'm not a big guy for, you know, sticking numbers and nothing, things <laughs> on my body to kind of be out there. But I had to tell myself, like, literally, if you want to be happy, you need to be happy. Right. You got to make yourself happy. So if there's a man watching right now that doesn't like his body, it's up to you to change it. Nobody else. And if you fail five times, guess what? There's 5.5, 6, 7, 8. You can still fail three more times and still make it. Mm -hmm. So I held on through, we got through COVID, and then this is where I'm going to go back to my dad's story. Yeah. Um, meanwhile, through COVID, I get a phone call from my, my, my father's family. This was two days before my wife's birthday in December, and they're like, hey, um, this is so-and-so, Giancoulis, um, I'm your uncle, and um, we know we no one's reached out to you in years, we just want to let you know your father's dying, he's on life support. 
He's at St. Joseph's. Brethren, he left me in that hospital. Mm -hmm. Yeah. See how the world turns around? Totally. So he's in St. Joseph's. He's dying of many, you know, ulcers and this and that. He's been drinking for years. Um, and we're just letting you know. And, and at first, I'm like, how do you guys call me now, 44 years later? Like, you guys have done enough. Where were you guys? <laughs> you no, know, we can't fix that. We're just letting you know if you right. want to come, you can come. So what did I do? I went to my wife. You know, she's the only person that I can confide in. She's like the conciliary with the godfather. Before they yeah. wax somebody, yeah. they call my guy. Yeah, you come on so in. <laughs> my wife, it's up to you. She goes, I can't answer this for you. You do what your heart feels. And I sat there and told myself, do I go to St. Joseph's? What do I do? I'm going to go. And I pictured, I'm going to go in the hospital. I'm going to see this guy in his deathbed. Mm. I'm going to see a man who's frail. And then I'm going to want to start talking to him. And then I know all that, that demon's going to come out. And mm. I know myself. I don't, I sometimes I'm impulsive. I do not know how to hold myself. I don't want to be yelling and, and freaking out at somebody when they're on their deathbed. It's not right. going to make me look bad. So I said, you know what? I said, God, I'm not going to go see him, let him pass, but I'll go to his funeral. And two days later, he died. Um, his family told me, do you want to come to his home to, you know, get see some of his belongings, whatever, to learn about him? I said, I'll go. So I, I went to the funeral. I took my wife and my daughter. And uh, I told my daughter, like, this is the person that made me. Like, this mm. is the coffin. I went to the funeral and I don't know how to explain this to you. I don't know if anyone's watching you. I know everyone watching has gone through sorrow and pain. Everyone. Mm -hmm. Mine is not the only. People have been abused sexually, verbally. They're still in marriages that are hard. People don't have money and they're trying to raise their kids and they're working at Tim Hortons and McDonald's two, three times to just give their kids education. Mm -hmm. So we all have pain and trauma, but the trauma can either conform you and, and make you become this nasty person or can transform you, right? Mm. So I went, paid my respects. I touched his body. It was a cold, like, fake person. I looked at mm. it and I'm like, damn it. Like, uh, you made me? I'm like, this is crazy. Um, all his family had no balls to talk to me. Didn't even have the urgency. Couldn't even come up to me and say, hey, man, let me hug you. You're, you're a part of our blood, okay? He's Macedonian. My mom's Greek. All my life, I told people I'm Greek. I said, there's no Macedonian told me. Went to his home. I went to go see where he was living. And he was, you know, living, renting a, a basement apartment in some lady's home downtown. And when I went inside, bro, it just crushed me. And I started, I started probing. And I'm like, yo, when you meet people in the gym and you probe and you ask them questions, you don't just look at someone who's overweight and be like, yo, you're fat, you're lazy. You don't do that. That's not you. You ask questions. There's always trauma. So I started asking the lady, like, how long did he live here? 35 years? Yeah. Your dad was a great guy. Your dad always talked about you. And I'm like, what? Your dad, yeah. I go, what about my brother? Oh, he talked about him a little bit, but he always mentioned to you. I look on the wall, and there's fucking pictures of me bodybuilding and a picture of me and my wife, bro, on his wall. And I'm like, how is this possible? I'm going inside. I'm like... He had like five suits. He had no TV, no phone, like bare minimums, bro. Bare minimums. Two mattresses on a four on on four concrete bricks. And I'm like, wow, man. So then I started asking her, and he's like, yeah, his family wasn't helpful. You know, they told me that you know your dad, his father died in the war in Macedonia, so he never met his dad. His mother was a piece of shit, which is because she remarried some rich person some guy who was like 80 when she was 40 had two twin daughters and abandoned her own kids and said yo i'm gonna bring you to yaya well, yaya is like the grandmother and she left them so here i am hating the person who left me meanwhile he was in the same boat as me and she left to, and to, came to toronto and had a brother and sister and if they ever watched the show shame on you guys for not helping out your younger brother like if, if my if, if my wife gets sick and she's in the hospital for a month and she's in a coma, bro, when she wakes up, I know there's going to be something wrong. So after four months, they didn't help him out. And back 40 years ago, bro, there wasn't mental health. There wasn't, oh, you're depressed. They didn't have that. You're divorced. Must have been your fault. You're a drinker. You're an alky. Or you're, you're crazy. 
You're crazy. You're crazy, right? That's yeah. that mental health thing that back then was you're crazy, you're psycho. Remember they put Alice Cooper in a in a psycho ward. Remember back yeah, in the day? They put Alice Cooper in a psycho ward, but he was a drinker and he was just a little off, right? So right. And and I couldn't and I'm thinking to myself, holy crap, bro, you're a smart guy. You don't need to put two and two together. He was bitter with his life. Yeah. His mom abandoned him, took these two twins and made them their love. He came here 19 years old, reckless guy. I know I'm, I'm I know when, if it wasn't for my wife, bro, we wouldn't have this gym. <laughs> if it wasn't for my wife, yeah. I wouldn't have, you know, wow, my team. I wouldn't have me because she's been a spine that said, yo, wrong friends, wrong crowd, mm. wrong this, wrong decision. Wow. So I'm like, damn it. And I told my mom, why didn't you tell me all this shit? She's like, what do you want me to tell you? She goes, I didn't get into this. He left me. I yeah. had to raise you. Totally. So I'm like, okay, I get it from her end. But had I known he was living like this, bro, and while I was in my 20s, 30s, 40s, enjoying life, going on vacations, making money, building mm. my career, I would have sent this guy money on the side and said, yo, someone help the guy. Mm. He had an issue. But he, she said he always talked about you. And I go, well, what do you mean? Like, didn't he want to come see me? And she goes, oh, no, he, he knows that you, you know, you guys didn't want to talk to him. And he, he kept saying, oh, my kids are good, but they don't want to see dad. No. So it's so a poor guy. He, he came up with his own story. Totally. And at first, like I, I went home and I went to the driving the spot. I parked my car and I never bawled this hard in my life with my wife next to me. Mm. I bawled, bro. And it hurt. Mm -hmm. It hurt for 45 minutes, yeah. but then it felt like it was like, you know, when it's, you know, when you go to like the Caribbean, my favorite place, Jamaica, and mm -hmm. you're expecting the sunshine is all this rain. And you're like, <laughs> Damn, what a waste of a vacation. I'm ready for my jerk chicken. It's all rain. And then all of a sudden the sun comes out mm -hmm. and you're like, yes, this is why I came to vacation. I literally felt this toxicity come off me. Wow. And I grew, I, I think I matured at 44 saying, you know what? Men suffer, man, yeah. and men keep it quiet, and mm -hmm. men need just as much help as a woman. If mm -hmm. anything, men are supposed to be this macho guy, the tough guy, the guy that can work, pay the bills, come home. But there's a lot of men that are struggling. Mm -hmm. So due to the fact that God gave me the opportunity, I'm going to call it the opportunity of COVID, not the, the, the negativity. He gave us the opportunity to pivot and then people started reaching out to me. Guys are, I, I didn't know what to do. So I'm like making videos on COVID and I'm making these live workouts and three people are following me. And then I had my kids and my wife are doing cooking shows. We went through the worst time, bro. Yeah. But people started reaching out to me and say, hey man, you look fit. I need help. So I'm like, you know what? Okay, perfect. My other coach, Vince Del Monte, I got an online training program going on. He goes, yo, put your shit on the app, reach out to people. Your gym can't be the only thing you're doing. If the gym goes by tomorrow and COVID comes back in, what are you going to do? Yeah, exactly. So I, I, I didn't know what to do. And I'm like, I didn't know which audience to grab. And remember when I met you, man, yeah. the biggest thing that I kept talking to you about was, I don't know what to do. Like I've always sold to co-ed and men and women. The gym has been men and women all my life. And then you're like, go with your heart, bro, and stop worrying about who you're going to please and please you. Mm. And I said, you know what? You're right, bro. I'm a man now. I'm not no young boy. I'm not no, you know, bachelor on Instagram, <laughs> shredded, no kids, no mortgage, no, no responsibilities. I'm not one of these guys that people want to aspire to when they're in their 20s. You go be 46 or like you, you're like, what, you're 50 now? 55. 55. You're, 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 you're at a point now. 55, bro. You look, you look 25, <laughs> man. You look like, look at you. So Thank I told you. myself, you got to be the role model now. You got to show men out there and work with them. So I said, perfect. I'm going to work with men over 40. I want to help them out. I want to, mm -hmm. you know, be the motivator, the driving force for them. And I want to help their wives as well. But to me, it's important to help men who've got kids yeah. or even men who want to have family because so many guys getting married today, they get so confused at looking at chasing other tail with women or looking at there's a good life of what they think can be amazing. Mm. And then there's the boring life of having one woman and your kids and all. And there's so much confusion and there's mm. so much confusion of guys thinking they got to grind and keep quiet and not tell no one. And the mm. one thing about me was with my coaches, I was always be able to open up. 
And I was always able to say to them, hey, man, I feel down, I feel low. And they're like, what do you mean, bro? Don't worry. Remember when you first started to where you are? So I told myself, listen, I'm going to be a coach from now till I die. Whether it transforms into consulting or public speaking, whatever, I'm a coach first and foremost. I'm going to be the guy that's going to tell show dads, listen, just like you, we can do this. And I really want to help. I really want to help share my story because I kept it quiet for so long and it didn't Mm. serve me. No. And what am I? There's people who have been abused. There's people who've been abandoned, worse than me. There's people who have been, they go to war and come back with a limb missing. Then they go to the Paralympics and they win gold. Or they talk on stage and I'm like, wow, this guy's a burn victim. <laughs> yeah. I never had a dad, but I'm not burned. I'm not smart. So I kept, my mom had this thing when we were young. And now she's older and she's lost her strength and her ability to be that strong. She was a man growing up. She wasn't a woman. She was a man woman. Because she mm-hmm. raised me, my brother, like, you know, with so much discipline that we hated her for, but now we love her for it, right? right? And she always told me, every time I would complain to her, Ma, you know what? Look where we live, man. She'd be like, well, listen, there's always going to be kids that are really, really rich and have a mom and dad, but there's some kids that are in poverty below you. And then, Ma, I want Nikes. And, you know, I remember I wanted Reebok, and she bought me Racerbok from <laughs> from, 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 from Wuko. My way, my way, that's right. <laughs> and, and I remember her saying to me, listen, I know you want a Reebok, but this is Racerbok. Mm-hmm. It's okay because there's kids who are always going to be richer than you and mm-hmm. some poor. She goes, you're in the middle. And that kept me sane and that made me say, okay, you know what? I can be the one to transform it and go through. And not that I've become this multi-millionaire successful guy, but as a man, as a 46-year-old guy that's walking around, I can hold my head up high and be proud of it. And I know that I can still help people out that are in a state where they need it. They may need a push. They may need an injection of motivation. Mm. They may need someone to talk to, right? And yeah. I think it's up to us coaches that have been doing it. And to you, it's easy. Like to me and you, wake up and go do legs. No problem. You know, mm. let's go do a 4 or 5K even in the rain. We'll do it. Mm. So we need to give yeah. that energy back to people. Yeah. No. You know? Um, I agree with you. I think, man, that story is incredible. I want to touch on a couple of things that you said. I think are very, very important for men to hear because, you know, when I'm, I'm working with these guys in their forties, fifties, sixties, seventies, and you said something that was very important. You said back in, when we were younger, right, there was no social media. There was no, um, you know, like there was no, no cell phones. So disturbance, there wasn't disturbance. And now it's nasty. You get all this fakeness. But back then, us we went through a lot of men went through a lot of trauma and a lot of trauma, like sexual abuse, physical yeah. abuse. There was a lot of shit going on back in the eighties and in the seventies, and then even in the late fifties. They just did their best. There are some of yeah. the immigrants, right? Right, exactly. But what happens with us guys is as we're getting, obviously we're not back then, we didn't want to share this with anybody because as we mentioned, there was no mental, mental health wasn't a thing. Mental health wasn't cool like it is today. Going to see somebody, that means you're crazy. So we hold it in, right? We push it down and we continue to push it down for in our 20s, in our 30s when we're grinding and trying to get a family and a career. But when we get to 40, that thing is too too much for us to keep down like in regards to it starts coming out and it starts making us uh it forces us to make very bad decisions so we start making horrible decisions in our lives we start sabotaging ourselves because we think we're not worth it so we're going to get to this this here and although we could go further up we sabotage right because we, we're not worth it because we haven't dealt with that thing that we kept kept down and we continue to try to push it down but the sabotage happens in our health we don't focus on our health we don't work out and if we start to work out and we're not getting the results or we work out and get results we don't feel like we're worth it i have men in my program who one year they become an alpha OG and it's like, oh my God, dude, like this is an incredible transformation. They're still and holding they're, on to baggage. And then they're gone. And then when they come back, it's like, what happened? And you know, when we start to open up about conversation, it always comes down to there's something going on back that you need to let go. And that's what I wanted to bring up is the importance of us men in our 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, in order for us to get, you know, to, to peel back the onion and give us give ourselves a room to grow, we have to let go. 
because we are keeping, we're holding on to shit that, like you, we're holding on to what was going on with you and your father and not having a father. And like that just became resentful and anger. And I'm okay, I'm okay, I'm okay. It affected my relationships, bro, because right. even growing up young, you're like, you're thinking if, if you, if you have all this, this, this hate in you, you don't look at marriage as this holy thing. Right. You look right. at it like, well, it cannot maybe work. So maybe I shouldn't get married. Maybe I should just be a gigolo and party around. <laughs> and then there's guys that keep becoming gigolos and then that becomes more damage to them. Totally. And I honestly feel if my father never passed, mm. I would still be holding on to that because oh, I'd be sure. saying to this day, where is this guy? I'm 46 yeah. now. I got kids. My kids can't meet their grandfather. But I understand that he, and I even spoke to his sister after, and we connected. And I told myself, bro, he never had the opportunities you have. Right. So he only knew that guys, you know, tell me your first five friends and I'll tell you who you're going to be. So if all your friends are drunkies and they're sitting in a coffee shop gambling all day, you're going to become a gambler and a junkie. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And so, um, it like, like you, you, you got the opportunity to let it go. Like since you've let that go, right. How has that enabled you to move forward with your life, your business, your relationships? It's helped me get to the nucleus of people. In, like when I meet with people and they have stresses and problems, like I, I met, I met someone yesterday and they told me that they're in a marriage and, and the marriage didn't work out and they had to flee here and go there. So I know how to understand them now, but then I know how to tell them to departmentalize and say, let's go deep inside. And where's that, where's that thing coming from? Where's that stemming from? Let's face that. Don't hide it because you can keep hiding it, but it's like, it's like weeds versus um, an orchid. Okay. And, and Bedros Cooley is one of the best people who said this. The orchid is so delicate and fragile. You can't put too much water or it dies. You can't give it too much heat or it dies. You know, you got to water with just an ice cube. And it's so fragile. And he says you got to be anti-fragile. Whereas a weed, you can put cement blocks on it. A year from now, it's going to start coming from the corner. You can spray it, kill it. Again, a month from now, it's going to keep coming up. So like you said, that toxicity ain't going to go away unless you deal with it. And sometimes dealing with it means go get therapy. Yes, you know, go speak 100%, to someone. 100%. That is my number one thing I tell guys is go talk to somebody who has no skin in the game. They don't know who you are. So whatever they're telling you is what they're seeing without any, you know, like knowledge of who you are. Those are the type of people you want to talk to because they have no, um, that's what I'm looking for. Like they have no skin in the game, right? They just, they're just there to help you. Yeah, they're unbiased people. They're yeah, they're Right. right. They're going to listen. They're, they're going to, this is what I'm seeing. And for us guys now, that is more important than anything. Our goal is to provide, protect, procreate. And we also have to continue to grow as we get older. And if we're continuing to make bad decisions or things aren't working out in our life, or every time I do this, this happens, or I can't stay consistent, or I've got a sugar this, or my wife does this, or my kids are this, and you start blaming everybody and throwing people under the bus, you got to look to in here. And the only way to get rid of that guys is going to talk to somebody you will not get rid of it on your own because you've had it for so long and that and is I, going to i kind of i kind of almost taught myself how to be a therapist when i would tell people because yeah. as a young kid my mom kept saying why do you got to keep telling people i remember sometimes even my wife saying you know why are you always opening up to people when they meet you mm. like you're strangers mm. and to me it was like but I'm proud of myself. I'm proud that I am where I am in my... Some people, when they come from dysfunctional family, mm. they have problems and they don't fix it. And some of them do very well. So I wanted people to know who I am. Yeah. I didn't want to paint this fake picture of, oh, well, things are really good. Yeah, yeah. No, things aren't good. And they didn't mm. come up good. But you know what? I'm going to make them good. And I always felt almost better after saying it because one i got rid of it and if i said it a thousand times i was spewing out some of the toxicity it was leaving my body mm, and yeah. then they would say wow like that's that's unbelievable i wouldn't know what to do if i didn't have my father and mm. then i kept getting those little those little pats in the back saying you know what bro let you go there's another guy who said they wouldn't know what to do and there's another guy who said wow i come with both parents and i and i still feel that i haven't had the success that i can have so one, you got to deal with your past trauma, 100%. number one, okay? Whether it's, and it doesn't have to be a psychologist because some people, they don't feel comfortable talking to a shrink. 
Yeah. I feel more comfortable talking to a, a fitness coach or to a sports coach because they're going to speak my language. They're going to give me some training tips and whatever. Then they'll give me a little bit of talk. Mm. So one, speak to someone, get help. You. Number two, fix you. Fix your body. You want to become a better businessman, a better father, a better husband? Fix you. Make yourself be the one that's proud because you've taken the tool and you've changed something about you. Now, I don't mean get down to 10% body fat, but I'm just saying fix you. If your health, and there's markers that tell us where we are, just like your bank account will tell you if it's negative, if it's neutral or positive. So if there's markers that tell you you're obese, then lose some weight. If there's markers that say that a man at 40 should be able to do 15 push-ups, get to five or 10, fix yourself, work on you. Cause if you can work on you, you build, you build the, the, the competence. If you can build the competence, then you, you build the ability for you to have confidence. And then if you have confidence and competence then you change your character and then you're like, wow, I'm not that old guy. I'm not the guy who's a drinker and who's a porn addict or, you know, stuff claw and keep locked up. I talk about it and I get open it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, transparency is key. Like one of the things I always say is the most powerful person in the room is the person who doesn't have anything to hide. Um, and that is like, you know, I'm, I'm most of the time, you know, I've had, I, I'm, you know, I'm in, in recovery. I've been an addict. I've fucking, you know, there's a lot, but I don't keep it back specifically from my guys because I know that every single guy that I talk to has something. Everybody has something. So me telling my story or letting people know or putting my guard down or, you know, that's just me, A, just being me and just, okay, whatever, man. Like, I know you got shit too. So, you know, that that's it. And it lets but, them open up to you too, which is good. 100% it gives. Yes, it gives them the, it gives them a little bit more, oh, this guy isn't, like this guy's actually cool. Every time I meet somebody, for instance, I went to my sis my cousin or sister. I went to her, uh, she had a wedding party, some wedding party that she went to. So I walked in and, you know, I'm a bigger guy, like, you know, and compared to all the other men in there, right? So a lot of times men are afraid to kind of speak to me, right? Because they, they get- They're intimidated, they, man, they think you're going to be this, big, this but, meathead who's going to yeah. be all- Confident, super confident. Exactly, but sometimes they also try to, to try to big themselves up, right? And I, you know, so for me, what I do is I, I kind of, I always, I'm the talker. I, I say hi to everybody, and I always kind of let them know that, hey, man, like, oh yeah, I had a really tough day today. Blah 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 blah. So, so you know what I mean? And then, and then it allows them to like sit back and go, oh, I, you're not how I thought you would be. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, and then next thing you know, we're talking. But men have to be able to kind of put that ego down right and 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 allow because the other thing you talked about which which i just want to get to before we leave is the isolation the not having friends because as we get older like men 40s 50s 60s 70s specifically we don't have friends we don't have friends like our our our, our wives do like i mean real guys who you can call and talk and whatever we lose our buddies that we've we've had before just because of life right people move right. people get families people get jobs so sometimes we end up lonely and if you're retiring and you're lonely that That's ain't dangerous. good that ain't good so we need connection men need connection with other men who are on the same journey as them right like you talked a little bit about being lonely or something but i guess it, it was probably yeah, because we were working it was, it was always working and it was always especially during the COVID time man that's where the whole world became lonely and yeah. that's where your traumas pop up man totally because when you're quiet and you're lonely and you're nervous and you're anxious and your body's kicking in the cortisol mm. then you start remembering all this old stuff coming in yeah and it, it starts making people second guess where they are and what they're doing so yeah. that's why, to me, training and fitness and competing has always been my drug. Totally. And it's like, even till today, my kids don't get why I keep pushing them <laughs> to go compete. If you don't make the team, go back again. Yeah. Go play basketball outside. Why are, and they're like, why is everything about fitness? Because <laughs> there's a certain feeling you get inside when those endorphins are kicking and you're sweating. And mm -hmm. the world just kind of goes quiet for a bit. And you're involved in that sport, that fitness. And mm -hmm. then you feel better because you accomplish something. And mm -hmm. to me, you mentioned ego. I think ego is the biggest, biggest killer of every man. Totally. Because when you're too confident to admit you need help, mm. that's very dangerous. Yeah. Because if you can't 
tell your wife, hey, man, I'm going to go hire a coach or I'm going to go speak to a therapist or I'm going to go talk about my drinking problem. You're, you're thinking that you can control it and mm -hmm. you're, you're trying to make up this image of who you are. But mm -hmm. in reality, it's not true. And yeah. then God speaking to you and your subconscious is telling you you shouldn't be doing that. It's like whenever anyone watching here who says, I'm, I'm not going to hit the snooze or I'm going to work out tomorrow. The minute you don't work out tomorrow, your body goes, why'd you do that for, man? You know you wanted to. Mm. And why, just, why are you lying to yourself for? And then mm. we just keep trying to mask it. The totally. mask of masculinity. Yeah. And there should not be no mask of masculinity. You should wear yourself on your sleeve. Mm, totally. And, and, and if, if guys are comfortable enough, and, and I'm sure hundreds of guys in your program have been mentored from you because they see a real coach. They see mm. someone who's giving them the, the assistance they need, the guidance. You've built such an amazing community of Thank thousands you. of men, forget hundreds, thousands of men over the years. And now you've built this reputation where one day when you and I lay to rest, mm. you can look at yourself when it's time to be chosen and say, hey, man, I'm Funk Roberts and I did really well. I, yeah. I gave back and I've helped people. And if I go at 55, 57, 97, I've given back and I've done well. And I tell people that is how I want to know when I die, that mm. I've given my best to my wife, to my kids, to my community, and to, again, we need to learn to be selfish a bit because I always tell people, do it for you. So a mother should do it for her and not her kids and not her family, for yeah. her. Because if she can do it for her, she feels stronger for her or a guy for him, then you can give back to your family because mm -hmm. you don't have this fakeness about you. Yeah, no, I, and I appreciate the kind words. It's amazing. It feels good. Um, yeah, man. And uh, yeah, I, I agree with you on, on the, you know, there's two incidents that, that, come up this quick two little quick stories i had him uh one of my members who um was just doing he was in like the second phase of the so he just finished phase number two and thing his life started to change he was getting a new job uh him and his wife were kind of getting you know his wife was really excited that he, his body was changing and you know he was feeling really good and then literally the next week he's like okay i have to you know quit the program i you know i got a new job and we're trying to save money and so I have to quit the program. And so, cause you know, and also cause my wife probably, you know, wants me to quit too, because we got to save. And so I, I sent them a video and I said, do you honestly think, I said, okay, great, lovely, but just think about where you were and where you are and what were the things that where you were when you first came to this program, you just lost your job, fucking, you know, shit was happening. You, you started doing this program and now you're getting a job. You got the confidence to go sit in, in an interview. You got the job. Now you have a new job. Your body's changing. Your health has changed because you, he was very unhealthy. And you, do you honestly think your wife is going to applaud you for, for doing this? Right. And so I just kind of push back a little bit and, you know, to, and then we canceled yeah. and we canceled. And then two days later, it came out. It's like, my wife is pissed off at me that okay. I canceled a $29 a month thing that was actually doing me better. It was the money, the ego, because he felt that he didn't need yeah, it. And totally. sometimes that's what I'm saying, man, as a coach, I'm glad you did that to him because a do. good coach that cares yeah. will put their arm in and shake the client and say, yo, yeah. this is where you are. You're not living congruent to what you said to be. And mm -hmm. we're confident enough to know that if the person will decide to leave, no problem. We're trying to yeah. help them out. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And if they decide to stay, they'll get results. Yeah, he's back, by the way. But anyway, <laughs> he's back. He realized, yeah, man, my wife was really upset about that, which where he thought that she would be, uh, she wouldn't be, right? Uh, and the other guy uh, was uh, somebody who was, again, phase three, almost getting a milestone. And then he decided to not work out one day because, you know, the week was a little bit crazy. So he didn't work out. But that one workout that he didn't do ended up two days, three days, three, and now four days four. because he was tired. Uh, one of the things we have in our program is accountability. So we have accountability Sundays. Every Sunday, you you prepare for the week. So you know, okay, I'm going to have challenges this week. How am I going to deal with it? Here are my foods. Here is when I'm going to do my workouts. Obviously, he wasn't doing it. But that exact thing, and, and it's great for him because he became aware. It's like, oh, my God, I missed one saying I was going to do it the next day. But the next day, the same thing happened because I, you know, like now I'm four days out. And uh, instead of making a plan to get that workout done. Like you have to get that workout done. So if you're coming home late, you're working out and then you're going to sleep. Cause if you yeah. don't do that, it's going to compound. So it's great that, you know, 
It's, it's that's where men need a good, strong, confident coach. And that's why if 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 a coach has never been through trauma, yeah. they won't be able to give this much love and as passion as they can. Mm -hmm. And that's why when guys are going through that and they're paying for a coach, they got to remember, I'm paying this guy to keep me in line because I can't do it alone. Right. I couldn't build this gym alone. I need my wife and my staff. Mm -hmm. I can't do everything, you know, my wife can't do everything on her own. She needs my help. So we all need help. Totally. And all of the best. In his new book, in, in his new book, be be um be useful. He talks about in the first chapter, people say to me, Wow, you're the self-made billionaire guy. He goes, No, I wasn't. My coaches, the, the mm -hmm. actors, the producers, the makeup mm -hmm. artists, everyone has to come involved to help out. So when people want to be a lone ranger and they don't want to invest in a coach because they think I'll just try it on my own, all you're doing is you're wasting time versus collapsing time with mm -hmm. a coach. Yeah. That's, yeah. That's you, having a coach. A hundred percent coach and a, 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 you know, a good tribe and community of, of the of people who are on the same journey as you, right? Like you want to be around five people, you know, your five close people should be, you know, better than you. They should be on the same journey as you. They should have the same mindset as you. And so sometimes you have to get to a point where, okay, I'm going to join this group of people or I'm going to get a coach that is going to keep me focused and is on the same journey so that we speak the same language. We know the, 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 the pain. We can help each other stay accountable. Because um, you've you also built pupils in your program, and I know that because you've told me about it because now I'm seeing it. <laughs> with me where yeah. some of my students are becoming the mini coaches in oh, the group Craig and Moore. they're posting. I got, you know, yeah. Julian in my group and a few other guys mm -hmm. and they're being Dimitri. They're yeah. like posting messages and, and yeah. I'm like, wow, I'm waking up to 6 a.m. And I'm like, these guys are having full chats in the phone yeah. of things they're going through. So that's yeah. what guys should be moving towards investing their money into. Cause again, it's not a bad thing to have a coach. People no. think by having a coach, Oh, then I, I must be doing something wrong and I need help. No, man. It's like having a teacher. The only yeah. difference is they're going to be teaching you something different. Yeah, we all need coaches until we until the end until we die. We need we need, we should need coaches and teachers and mentors to help guide us um, and make sure that we're on the right tracks. People that can help us and people who have done or are doing the things that we want to achieve. So don't be afraid. Dimitri, this has been amazing. We definitely have to have you back on to, to really dive into some of your tips and tricks for men over 40. But at this point, please share with us where we can find you, your YouTube channel, Instagram, all of that thing. Where can we find oh, you? I love that, man. Uh, Dimitri Jankoulis on YouTube, coach underscore underscore Dimitri on, um, on Instagram. And for all you old guys, Facebook, just Dimitri Jankoulis. Okay. Dimitri, man, thank you so much. This what about if I powerful. want my guys to follow you as well, man? Where can we find you at? Well, you can find me at over40alpha.com, but they, you if your guys, your guys should be following you because that's you're you the go. you're the man. I I I I subscribe and I you know you're the guy, man. You're amazing, and uh, thanks, bro. Yeah, I can't I can't wait to uh, to talk to you again. So thank yeah, you for man. being on the podcast. I appreciate you. Next time we do one, you'll come in my studio. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely as well. All, all right, right man. Thanks for having me, and peace out to all the guys who are watching this. Thanks so much, and we'll see you again.